Hello, today I'm going to be talking to Jonathan Curtis, who's a drummer, drum set player, snare drummer, composer, a music teacher as well, a musician, a man of many talents, and someone who's built his own studio, um, which you can watch on YouTube. He's a YouTuber, of course. I discovered his content and his teachings on YouTube. And uh, yeah, so I thought it'd be interesting to have a talk to Jonathan, who's thought about a lot of things that I've thought about and um, seems to have a lot of insights into the world of drums and drumming. Introduce a little bit uh, to the viewers what you're what you're sure. doing at the moment, Jonathan. Sure, I'll try. So I, I started um, started playing the drums aged eleven, uh, far too many years ago to to recount, and decided following um, a, a master's degree uh, when I was in my early twenties, uh, decided to turn self-employed as a musician uh after getting accepted to do a phd in philosophy but actually not receiving any funding for it mm -hmm. ironically um musician was my backup <laughs> um nevertheless turned self-employed round about 13 years ago and i've been working as a, a freelance drum drum kit player ever since um worked in the industry as primarily a session player doing a lot of freelance work um and around about 2017 2018 really got into the idea of writing so I, I, I've tried my hand at writing a few books really got interested in the educational side the compositional side and, and as you were suggesting just recently I've been working more on the snare drum side I was fortunate enough through the uh, Covid pandemic to receive a grant from Arts Council England that allowed me to study the snare drum uh, as a, in, a, in a sort of full-time capacity and since then have, have stayed with it really enjoyed doing it so right now I'm completing a second project from the Arts Council that's mm -hmm. uh, again mainly concerned with composition and an educational element writing about it studying it researching it and hopefully presenting those findings in an interesting way okay did you have uh, experience doing snare drum stuff prior to this or did you you know as in did you just divert or, or bring your attention to the snare or or was it a new topic for me i i, I never really learned the snare drum repertoire so now yeah. i'm sort of teaching myself or working on that sometimes i i take lessons but i'm working through some of those wilcoxon solos sure. which i never yeah. really did as a kid i think in the yeah. united states it would be a more common thing for people to have worked on snare drum stuff I think so. yeah yeah but did you have some prior experience with it then I, before embarking i did on? it's funny you mentioned wilcoxon because round about when i was about 15 or so i walked into a music shop in town and and randomly found wilcoxon uh, rudimental swing solos for the modern drummer uh, or swing solos for the modern drummer or rudimental drummer whichever whichever way around it was called I can't remember yeah. I think it was rudimental swing solos for the modern drummer I think it is yeah is that the one and, and I, I bought it knowing nothing about it and absolutely fell in love with it and tried tried my best to decipher it and learn from it and, and that began a sort of early love affair with the snare drum with rudimental drumming especially and while I had no professional experience with it um, until, you know, relatively recently, it was always something I was very interested in. I, I, I became relatively well known in my sort of local community as somebody that was interested in the rudimental uh, repertoire and things like mm -hmm. that. I've, up here on my shelf, I've got a pearl marching drum that I bought many years ago, long before I had any use for it. Yeah. So I certainly always had an interest in it and did did enjoy the technical aspect did enjoy working on on will coxon and, and latterly john pratt as well but when covid happened and i found this project grant for the arts council the project and the idea just really kind of fell into place from nowhere i suddenly had all these ideas that i've been wanting to explore for a long time the compositional element the technical element the historical element the different traditions i was really getting interested in french rudimental drumming mm -hmm and it, i think it was just a lot of ideas that had been bubbling up for a long time that suddenly had this outlet 
and yeah. once once the the dam had burst so to speak it, it seems to have just carried on flowing so that's been it's been really nice um because I'd, I'd i'd been getting a little bit disillusioned with at least the professional side of drum kit playing i think so this has yeah. been a really nice diversion that i think probably has been a long time coming yeah and so it, i i guess it opens up the um avenues for for the compositional side of it when you're um writing for snare drum using the rudiments i guess i, I don't know i mean I, I know there's a few artists who play the drums uh, or the drum kit as a solo instrument but it's yes. it's not really i mean it's not something i enjoy listening to personally it, it doesn't seem the same even though there's theoretically more components to it yeah um there is a certain depth of composition that you can reach that that uh, even a uh, ignoramus like me can sort of appreciate with the the snare drum or the sort of percussion thing it feels like uh, I, I want to say it's like part of the classical world of things is there's you know how does that fit in with that are you are you potentially doing something that would allow you to play uh in the sort of classical milieu so to speak with orchestral musicians yes in theory i mean the the classical side the orchestral approach does exist on the snare drum as opposed to the drum kit you do find modern orchestras having drum kit players mm -hmm. um and and that's not necessarily a recent thing but certainly the snare drum has had a place in the orchestra far longer um th there are broadly different approaches. I mean, there's the rudimental side, which I've mentioned, there's the orchestral side, which is certainly non-solo based. The whole function is to yeah. exist as part of an orchestra. And they don't focus so much on rudimental playing in the same way Quite. as yeah. rudimental drumming as well, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And, and, yeah. and someone like uh, Jacques Delacluse, who's a French orchestral snare drummer, but composed solo material, mm -hmm. kind of bridged that gap where he was using orchestral repertoire, but in a solo context. And, and that, that was really interesting. And your main question about the the sort of the solo aspect of drum kit playing as opposed to the snare drum playing was something I was researching heavily in my first project grant because okay. one of the big questions I wanted to answer or at least explore was how on earth do you make solo compositions for a single sound interesting? Yep. How do you derive the musical content? And I think when we talk about the solo instrument, uh, the solo aspect of the drum kit, I'm pointing over here because my drum kit's here off screen. But this, the solo, the solo, the solo aspect of the drum kit. I think there's a functional shift because when we think of drum kit solos, you know, we might think of people like Dave Weckl or Vinnie Colaiuta who have mastered that art form. Yeah, it's always within a wider context. I mean, Dave Weckl doesn't go on stage and just play a drum solo for 40 minutes unless he's doing a clinic where there's an educational element. Yeah, the musical side, he's he's more likely to do a small contained solo as part of a larger set which provides a bit of contrast and a bit of, you know, excitement and things like that. Whereas the idea with, I think, the, so the, so the solo snare drum work is to find a more musical compositional side that is, yes, limited on the sound, but explores different concepts. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm sure many people enjoy just listening to solo drumming. So the difficulty, the challenge, especially when you're removing the rest of the drum kit and just focusing on a single instrument is, well, can we express rhythmic ideas? Can we express dynamic ideas? Yes, they lack the harmonic side, but is there enough enough depth there to still present something musically interesting? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, yeah, I don't know that I would listen to 40 minutes of snare drum necessarily. <laughs> no, I'm not um, sure many would. No. <laughs> and uh, is there a sort of extent to which there is there a growth thing where do you, does this expand out to, to other percussive elements potentially? So I suppose, you know, you can you can sort of derive a, a great deal of focus into the snare drum do you mm -hmm. assume that that's going to sort of blossom a little bit into some other sound sources being added is there a potential for a sort of almost um you know innovating new uh compositional ideas through a narrow focus or i don't mean narrow in a pejorative sense sure. but you know so being very focused on this one sound source does it then bloom out again you know are you going to get some other elements do you think into the mix at some point yeah that's that's really really funny that you mentioned that because that's precisely what i'm doing with this second project now at the end of the first project um it, it culminated in the publication of a collection of compositions of, of solo work and some duets as well with marimba and the the solo mm -hmm. work there was one piece in particular called decatria which is a, a mathematical piece based on the number 13 and it's it's about five minutes long um probably longer than that it's arduous it's long it's sprawling and meandering and it's exploring this complete mathematical concept and that really pushes 
the limit of I think what is like, enjoyable and accessible to listen to. I mean, I wouldn't expect many people probably even to be fair, myself included, on any given day to just sit down and relax listening to a six minute arduous snare drum solo. Yeah. That was, it was an exploration of concept. And I think at least for now that pushed it as far as I was able to take it. And since then I've come back around, as I say, I finished that project by doing four pieces with marimba. And now mm -hmm. in this new project, I'm working with percussive accompaniment. So okay. I'm doing, I'm doing a, a couple of days in the studio in a few weeks time actually with bass drum accompaniment it's more like a march format and then at the end of the year recording another five pieces which are kind of equally as arduous as the aforementioned one but with four piece percussion uh, three piece percussive accompaniment to try and again keep the idea of coherence and musical interest so yeah absolutely i think there's only so far you can push the solo element of a single drum and a single sound source before you're kind of clutching at straws and i think i yeah. at least for now felt like i reached that point and now i am bringing in other other elements to try and explore new things, but to keep it somewhat focused at the same time. Yeah, but it allows you, I guess, to have, like explore that one element in so much depth that when you do yeah. add more stuff to it, then you, you can really create something very rich uh, cool. with that. So yeah, I, th I find that really interesting. I mean, I, I like some, um, you know, like modern orchestral music that's very percussive. I got into yeah. um, listening to like Ionization because I'm a Zappa fan oh, yeah. and he used to talk about Verez and all of this. and. Uh, you know, uh, that's a kind of, I don't know, it's percussive music with, with these strange elements. And, and then it allows you to, to listen, I guess, to uh, different um, types of expression that are very percussive. And yeah, yeah it's, it, it's, it's interesting. So I guess um, I, my, my question to you sort of following this is like, when you're doing this process, because I, I very enjoyed watching a video of yours recently where you did a whole practice session and you narrated right. your process and how yeah. you're developing your skills. Um, I felt slightly guilty because I haven't done as much work in front of the mirror. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get my mirror out and I got yeah. my mirror out as well. But um, I, th I thought it was a really um, uniquely interesting thing. It's something that I thought about doing and it's, it's given me a motivation to sort of feel myself practicing something, even though my practice is a bit higgledy piggledy at the moment. Yeah. And I've been through pro um, um, uh, periods of my life where I've really, uh, I've worked quite similar to that in a way. Uh, like uh, a few years ago, I really tried to improve my technical facility and followed a fairly arduous routine of like practice pad stuff and trying to sort out my hand, which interestingly didn't really materialize into anything, but that, yeah. that's another story. But yeah, I thought it was really beautiful for you to share that process because the video making on YouTube thing, uh, again, we all, we've all got different motivations or I, I'm not even sure what my motivation is a lot of the time, but we want to share some information with people and there's often a thing of like maybe not sharing too much because we're trying mm -hmm. to attract someone to come and um and learn um you know and there's some people that seem to have a, a bit more of a conscious idea of of withholding but also yeah. there's just like on a practical level it's really difficult to share these things even if you yeah. wanted to and yeah. so i really admired the, the way that you uh, i don't know i don't want to sound too enthusiastic but um you know i i'd I like the fact that you just did that you narrated the process you explained the procedures and i think that uh, sharing these procedures with people this is the really secret stuff you know mm. so when you say oh the secret to improving at drums or whatever instrument uh, and there's always some sort of like magical sounding thing but actually it's having some sort of procedure mm. uh, what sort of process did you go through to arrive at these procedures I'm, I'm pretty sure you've read some of the books that I've read you've you've yeah. read peak um, you've looked into some of this like modern neurological educational yeah. stuff about how the brain yeah. um, assimilates stuff and obviously you also have a certain sense of your ability to organize your time yeah. and try and create a, a progression for yourself and you've broken that down and you've expressed that to other people i think we probably recognize that the same procedure is not going to work for everyone yeah but in, in another video you explained how you developed your double strokes by mm -hmm. learning different technical approaches but also realizing that you needed to figure out your own thing so i yeah. guess i'm being in a long-winded way getting to the thing of like at what point did you realize it was worth figuring out a procedure for yourself and how do you develop that procedure and examine whether it's working for you or not? Because I think people could benefit from just knowing that yeah, there's a thought no, process. No, I, I agree. I, I think that is really important because there's not enough information out there about how that works and how that can happen. I think the, the, the simplest answer is a long, long process of trial and error. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was getting it wrong for a very long time. 
and I knew I was getting it wrong for a very long time and I wanted to understand why because as musicians practicing is like the fundamental activity right yes. you, all the output we see may, as you suggested we usually only show people the finished project uh, finished product the things we've carefully vetted and edited to make us look as good as possible and I've done that we all do that it's important and part of the business but as a youngster even when I was in my teens and early 20s I was very keen to practice and I tried to practice but I, I just didn't think I did it very well mm -hmm. um, but that 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 gives you experience you you learn what works and what doesn't in you know small stages and I've been lucky enough to study with many great drummers over the years who have all shared their insights and Rick first, Dior I'm so Rick excited Dior, to see that name though it's beautiful phenomenal really. wonderful yeah. player and every question I've asked all these people you know, from Rick, Rick Dior right through to Dave Weckl and Thomas Lang and Virgil Donati and others who I've been very fortunate to encounter is always, how do you practice? What, what do you actually do when you get into the practice room and sit down and practice? And, you know, incorporating their answers, taking their answers and seeing, well, does that work for me? What does that make me think about? Because it's all part of a larger concept right as you suggested you can't just you can't just get a pair of sticks and a pad and a metronome and practice paradiddles for two hours a day and expect to be a better drummer mm -hmm. because it doesn't work like that and as we've all experienced that feeling of trying to dedicate time to working on technique and not getting anywhere despite our best efforts and it seems like the harder we push with it the further away we get from the goal so it, it became clear, I think, that something wasn't working. You know, I, I practiced as much as anyone else and I still wasn't getting any better. And yet people that seemed to do far less than me were playing far more comfortably than I was. And when I, I think it was a lot of really, as I say, trial and error, self-reflection, asking a lot of people, looking at a lot of sources and thinking, well, I need to change something because mm -hmm. something I'm doing is not working. And I think what I looked back on was where has most of my actual ability come from when i look at the things i was doing on a professional level like i was playing a lot of jazz shows for a period um so i developed a, a really strong right hand i developed a lot of good coordination and i thought yeah well i've practiced all of that stuff but actually most of that confidence and ability has come from doing it it's the gig. you know and it's the gig right so when i'm when you're sitting there for two hours playing some improvised pattern on the ride cymbal and you're having to keep up with the band and you're having to respond and react your right hand becomes very, very good at doing that. And I thought, you know, the things I was practicing on the pad, where I was really trying to get my left hand to do what my right hand was doing, I remember sitting there thinking, well, I never practiced this with my right hand, even though I'm, you know, I'm right hand yeah. dominant. I never practiced this. I never had to think about where I was holding the stick. It was just all that doing it. So I, I tried to adopt this approach of learning technique through actually using it. So I went back through all the Wilcox and stuff and I went back through the John Pratt stuff and De La Clues and Joe Tompkins and Bob Becker and all these composers who had written difficult material. And it's one thing to practice double strokes on a pad forever. And another thing to encounter a very specific instance of a five stroke roll or a nine stroke roll where you've got a flammed paradiddle after it and a ratama cue before it and you have to transition in and out of it. And learning it in that context is far more productive and far more powerful, I, be I believe, than simply just practicing double strokes on a pad. Yeah. So this kind of led me down this route of learn by doing, but in a very conscious way. So as, I, as you, you know, the videos you described of mine where I'm commentating on what I'm doing, I think just over, again, years and years of refinement and trial and error and thinking about it and adjusting, um, I just got, arrived at this stage quite naturally of very concept orientated. What's the bigger picture? What am I trying to achieve? What's the context we're working in? Because a double stroke roll is not just a double stroke roll. It's any, any infinitude of applications where we might just play two sticks, two strokes yeah. on each hand self-reflection self-analysis and i think it was just the you know the culmination of that process i've always been interested in practicing i've always been interested in theories of learning as you say learning about the the neurological aspect the con the concepts and all things like that practice practice methods practice mistakes practice theories so yeah i think that was just it was a very long process even that video you know which ironically seems to show me learning even that video and the concepts i'm talking about are themselves the culmination of a very long process yeah practicing is a skill
Uh, yeah, and, and I, the, the uh, idea that there's a way to practice, or, yeah. you know, if you do this, this will do that. Um, I mean, one of the things that's been a bugbear that I've let I've let go now was the, um, the you know, the the fast swing with the with the um, uh, Tony Williams five five yeah. note trick or yeah. diddling diddling, and being able to do that and. Um, I don't know why, because I'm, I'm not really a jazz guy. I did a thing where, where and just sort of reflecting on what you were saying about, um, you know, that you're learning on the gig. I, I fell into a situation where I was playing a sort of residency for six months where every week I went and played swing with um, brushes. And I didn't yeah. really play the brushes very much. And I just sort of learned how to play the brushes there because I had mm -hmm. to turn up and do something. And, and that was, I learned a lot more than following all these exercises. That's and it. Um, I sort of had this thing where I'd been offered a couple of jazz gigs and I was scared of the up-tempo thing. And then I would do the just three for one, diddling, 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 if that even came up, which it doesn't very often anyway. And then I, oh, I need to do this Tony Williams and I need the fingers and all of this. And I've been, you know, very fortunate to, uh, I've been able to study with some people who really know what they're doing in this area. And I try to teach myself or, you know, had tuition and guidance with it. And I really try to learn how to do that thing. And it's just not happening. Mm. And and now I've, I've kind of got myself to a point where I, I don't really care. Mm. Uh, and if, if I have to do that. But um, yeah, there is this kind of uh, thing where you can watch like a million videos where they say how to do the fast swing and there's this thing with the hand going like that you know open it close it blah blah, blah and all this very deliberate stuff and i'm sure that works for a lot of people but then it's like oh and then cut uh, and the next thing you're going diddling 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 din. and it's like where's 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 it going from here to here yeah, and that's really hard. hours in between hundreds and hundreds maybe and yeah, it's it's again that it's kind of boring. You wouldn't want to watch someone do that, you know. And thankfully, you sped up the bits when you're <laughs> yeah, doing that in yeah. your your video. But yeah, it's that 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 thing of like, okay, what I learned from the process was that it's just like that's a level of something that I'm I'm uh, I'm over it now. I'm I kind of feel okay. I maybe I had to just actually resolve with myself that's all right not to be able to do that. Um, but the the idea of the trial and error that there is a methodology is is something that seems to be slightly evaded and maybe it's because uh, i think that a lot of even people at very uh you know levels of uh impressive achievement haven't always analyzed how they got there yeah and so again like uh, rick dior i love watching his videos he's at a level of of ability that is just astonishing to me and he's described in some of his videos what amount of work he did yeah and and so i feel like he's offered an, an insight into how he got that good and then you can go all right am i um, one thing am i going to spend those eight hours a day for 10 years doing that or am i happy enough with what i'm doing do i need that again like the double stroke roll yeah do, do i need as a rock drummer or as a jazz drum even to be able to play that brrrr mm. thing or not and you know maybe you can prioritize but also the um yeah looking at those books which i've, I've read sort of critically i'm not a scientist or anything like this but there's that kind of first of all i mean in peak he says oh yeah but by the way it's not ten thousand, but twenty thousand hours and that's even to get to the point that you can audition for the orchestra Mm -hmm. uh, as I recall, I mean, there was that idea. And uh, again, I've heard this in your videos where like, having a little roadmap of what you want to achieve and then learning to focus on what you want to achieve, being able to assess that. And then I think also being able to push yourself into a place of some stress. Those seem to be important uh, factors. And so those are very general ideas. But how you do that, I think, is is something. Um, but yeah, to what extent do you, do you feel like you, you could, do you think you could distill into a kind of sound bite of like what are the things that anybody practicing their instrument might want to learn how to focus on? Is, mm. is there an easy way to say, you know, ah, my top three tips mm. for uh, how to practice your instrument? Or is it really just n not distillable to that? Do you think? Well, I mean, if there's if they can all come with a big asterisk that we are grossly oversimplifying. Um, yeah. Tip number one first and foremost above all else is just sheer persistence yep. the, the, the number one thing that is going to cause you to succeed is sticking at it through yep. thick and thin and, and I, you know i know I, I know i look here young and youthful and exuberant but i'm you know i've been doing this a very long time and and failing it for a very long time yep. and I, I i've spent more than a third more than two thirds of my life trying to do what i do better so i you can't underestimate the time and the persistence it involves and and i have been a mediocre drummer for a very 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 long time 
it was it was through sheer persistence that I was able to somewhat climb out of that mm -hmm. and, and and succeed. And I think of all the all the wonderful people I've spoken to and learned from, it's it's almost always the same. I mean, I spoke to Rick Dior. I've had many lessons with Rick, and he's such a wonderful teacher. And he he said. You know, I'm in my, I think he's in his 60s, I don't wish to age the chap, but I think he's in his 60s and he said, you know, I'm, my kids are grown up, my, my, my work life is stable, I've got the time, I've got the energy and the, you know, the freedom to practice as much as I like. Mm -hmm. I didn't at your age, you know, at 36, I didn't in my 20s. Um, Dave Weckl, I've been lucky enough to study with Dave Weckl on two occasions and he said, well, I've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. 40 years, I, I'm not even 40 years old. And the yeah. chap's been, you know, he's been working at it for that long. So certainly number one is persistence. Just if you, you will fail if you quit. I mean, that's the, that's the one rule. Yeah, so sure. I mean, actually it includes in that people, because I've got students uh, of varying degrees of, um, you know, whatever, uh, being able to pursue, but, you know, a lot of uh, grown up students who've got other things to deal with in life. And I even think that applies to persistence. If you can spend that 30 minutes a day yeah. and you want to learn how to play the drums, you can get, I mean, th again, this is another sort of topic that maybe we could touch on, but I think you can get like really good at a thing with persistence and yeah. some regularity. So we're not necessarily talking about persistence of insane hours of practice necessarily. Oh, no, no not, not at all. But of, not, of that regularity that of sticking with it. That eight hour thing is a bugbear of mine. I mean, who's who Who in their right mind has got time to do something eight hours a day that's not work? Yeah. I mean, no one's paying you to practice eight hours a day. Yeah. And if you even, you know, even people without a family, they've probably got rent to pay, bills to pay, food to put on the table. Who's who's funding you to practice eight hours a day, even if you yeah. could form the focus to do that? What I think happens, you know, my experience of it and even, the, you know, the, the people I've worked with, you can put that much time in in the lead up to something. When I was doing a recording session of, of one of my composition collections, I was probably doing six to eight hours a day for a period in, yep. the, in the immediate lead up to it. Mm -hmm. And it nearly broke me. And then I did the recording and then I had to go and have a break for a few yeah, weeks. Let it go. Yeah, I, so, I mean, I don't, some people might be superhuman, you know, you know, reportedly someone like Virgil Donati can keep it up, but yeah. He's a very he's a very different person to me with a very different life and a very different way of doing things. So you, you don't need that. So the persistence element, though, is something that anybody at any level of aspiration yeah. can focus yeah. on, though, isn't yeah. it? It's, so it's that's, the that's one factor. One factor number one. OK, we need two more to be able to then get a nice little well, I, I think number clip. two, <laughs> number two, if we're doing a list, I think number two would be starting to take a bit of responsibility for your own learning as mm -hmm. opposed to putting entire the entire onus on sources of authority. And Ooh, I think lovely. this is something you touched upon in, in one of your previous emails to me. Young, young musicians, by which I don't necessarily mean young people, but people new to their instrument, drums or otherwise, so new musicians, they put an awful lot of onus on the teacher. And that's, that's important to a point, because obviously a good teacher is there to guide you through those difficult opening years. But at some point, you have to be able to challenge any authority that comes your way, challenge any dogma that comes your way, because teachers, myself included, are fallible and may be misinformed or may pass on misconceptions. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to say, well, OK, well, this is what my teacher says, but do I agree with it? And what does what do these other sources of authority think and how does that all line up with what I think? So take something really banal like learning to play a double stroke roll or even learning how to hold a drumstick, right? So some drummers will be very, very dogmatic as to where the fulcrum should be. It must be your index finger. It must not be your index finger. It must be your middle finger. It must not be. So for a, for a, a poor beginner who's just trying to learn to, ha to hold a drumstick, they're being bombarded by figure X, who's renowned and really good and world famous saying, no, you must do this. And figure Y, who's equally renowned and good saying, you must never do that. Yeah. And it puts them in a very, very difficult position to say, well, I genuinely now don't even know how to hold a drumstick. Yeah. So this this taking responsibility is having that confidence in yourself to say, what do I think? What feels good to me? I, I appreciate what this person is saying and I appreciate what that person is saying. I'll learn both of them. I'll try it both ways and I'll try it for myself. And I think that was a really important point for me. Um, being able to say, well, 
I have a say in this as well because it's my hand, it's my drumstick. Yeah. And if I'm trying something and it's just feeling uncomfortable and it's not working and it might even be injuring me or something, I'm going to try something else. And if the, the other thing I try is working better, I'm going to go with that and I'll make that decision for myself, even if certain authority figures or other, other drummers all say it's wrong. And th again, yeah. this was something Rick, Rick Dior said to me. And his, his proof is in the pudding. I mean, if you've seen him play, you'll see what a wonderful player he is. Yeah, absolutely. When he is saying to me, well, look, some people have told you this is wrong, but I'm doing it right now. That's a very compelling argument. So, well, look, it clearly works. Yeah. So there are some of the best players in the world that will play with an index finger fulcrum. Some of the best players in the world will play with a middle finger fulcrum. Yep. As long as you can see, well, okay, well, what's, what's right for me, what works for me, I'm going to learn, I'm going to educate myself as best as I can, but ultimately I'm going to decide. I think that's a really important step. So I guess if we want to step two, yep. it, would be, it would be educating yourself and giving yourself enough knowledge but confidence to say, well, what do I think? Yeah, question what you're being taught, yeah, and you can do that with respect to traditions and authorities oh, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, a sort of healthy skepticism, and you know, that's, that's the way I try to approach things. Uh, which is, yeah, I, think I so. don't really believe anyone, and so I try to see things. And you know, everyone has something that works. For them. I, I think I don't know to what extent this is in other instruments because I don't play any other instruments. But certainly in drumming, there are people who do stuff that looks really ridiculous and they look uncomfortable and blah, blah, blah. And th those people are playing beautiful drums, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, OK, good. Lovely. So do we have a third? Can we have a three? I, Sorry, guess, I, guess, it would be a, I guess it would be an extension of the second point. And it's I guess it would be something like learn to ask why both from others and of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if, if a teacher teaches you something, accept it and learn it, but ask why. What's, what's the reasoning behind it? What's the concept behind it? Why does a paradiddle have an accent at the beginning? Yeah. Why do I need to keep my little finger on the stick? Why yeah. do I want to play a ride cymbal in French script? And it's, it's, not, it's not an aggressive thing. It's not a cynical thing. It's just make sure, make sure you can understand the reasoning behind what you're being taught. And conversely, when you're teaching others, or teaching yourself, make sure you can answer that. Well, yeah. why am I practicing this? Why am I doing yeah. it in this way? Why That's am a I really important thing in teaching, I find. And I, and again, at any level of student, I'm thinking, okay, why am I? And, and that's one of those things I suppose that opened up these issues for me is is that you're going okay uh, I want to play the drums what should I do and then there's like 100 people going get a copy of stick control yeah and then it's like okay if you do ask why then maybe you'll get a copy of stick control but there's a quite a lot of different things you could do with yeah. that or not do yeah. with it and yeah. you don't yeah. have to do yeah so yeah asking yourself why and and yeah having uh, I was going to say self critical but i'm trying to to not frame things in that way but the mm. ab the ability to evaluate what you're doing uh yeah and just develop that sort of con confidence and in a way being able to go accept things that are imperfect as well because sometimes I, yeah. I feel that i've gone down this path of things where i just uh, end up focusing on all the things i think of as like oh not very good yeah and then actually <laughs> i think oh, what, what do i even care about well and i think that, that could be a that could be a tied third or a, a kind of juxtaposition to that one. Have, yeah. have a reason for what you're doing in terms of, like, I'll give you an example. I spent years in my 20s, probably a couple of years, learning how to play a left foot clave on the hi-hat. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would spend hours keeping this left foot clave going while trying to do single strokes and double strokes and paradiddles and then eventually play over the top of it. And it took a lot of time away from what I could have been spending with other things. And I got to a stage where I was pretty good with it. I can probably now with a push, sit down and play most basic things over a left foot clave without too much difficulty. But I've never once had to do it in a musical situation. I've never once had yeah. to do it for a professional job. And that was, I think, a case of me doing something because I felt I should rather than having actual need for it. Because obviously playing a left foot clave against everything else you do on the drum kit is quite a specialized high level thing. I mean, that's yeah. not something you need to do for grade eight or something like that. Whereas now I think I'm much more able to say, well, this is what I'm focusing on. And if I'm not so good at that other thing, that's okay. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved with that other thing right now. In, in working with the snare drum, as I've been doing for about the past three years, my kit playing has, if not suffered, probably stagnated. 
but yeah. that's okay because most of my work at the moment is is here with my publications and my teaching and things like that my composition so that's okay i'm happy to focus on the things that are actually of benefit to me right now and it's okay if i'm not so good at jazz at the moment or i'm not so good at that left foot clave if that slipped yeah. away that's fine it, there are there's a lot i mean it, there, there does seem to be quite a lot of stuff in in drumming that is pursuing some sort of functionality that isn't necessarily applicable to anything in real life and so yeah. you know we can all a attain mastery of different things but it, it does bear reflecting about um you know okay am i going to use this and you know and, and maybe you're using it if it brings you joy and that's mm. enough but um mm. yeah is this ever going to be in a gig situation am i going to use this or whatever which kind of brings me around to a question i was thinking about which is um since you've kind of brought your attention to snare drumming and you're, you're writing about the topic of writing compositions what would you um say in terms of like what are the benefits to me and um, maybe it seems a bit obvious but what are the benefits to me for instance of, of trying to get stuck in so wilcox and i've worked through a few of those i'm, I'm looking at his shortest there's that uh, american solo american drummer or whatever it's called All american with, drummer yeah, yeah with a load of solos and i'm trying to work for that and and i i don't always understand how to interpret some of the stuff there and i think you know would you say that's something that would sort of bring me a benefit as a kit player a lot of our heroes have come from that rudimental background uh there is a sort of conventional uh thing about every drummer needs to know rudiments which i don't think is a necessary thing i quite enjoy it mm. and you know yeah so do, do, do you think the rudimental playing is translatable to the drum kit is it is it uh, something that you'd recommend people to look at or is it just like if you fancy it have a go I think I think yes, it is something that would be beneficial to everybody. Um, I think it's something that every drummer should at least have knowledge of, um, because it is it is so foundational to the instrument itself. That and, and it's certainly in reference to what we were just talking about. That doesn't mean that every drummer of all stages and ages and abilities should suddenly go out and start dedicating all their time to learning rudimental drumming. Yeah. It doesn't mean that unless you want to, of course. But because it's it's the sort of the pedagogical basis of the modern instrument, whether we like it or not. I mean, the first drum kit players were snare drummers, you know, ex-Civil yeah. War drummers and things like this. They're the only people that could play the drums. So obviously the pedagogical aspect of the instrument has developed around the snare drum. There's a reason the snare drum is front and center on the kit. So I think it is worth from any serious student, and I don't mean that to sound sort of pretentious, but any, any student is serious about understanding the instrument. I think it is worth exploring it and learning a bit about it and the books like the all-american drummer are a great starting point for that because they're short they're not too difficult and from a practical side they expose you to the practical application of the rudiments well here is a double stroke roll actually applied to something here is a paradiddle yeah. actually applied to something and as we were talking about earlier i think you will actually develop strong technique through actually having to work on those things because to play wilcoxon number 32 at the given tempo you need a certain degree of technique so you will develop that t technique throughout the course of working on that piece it will help with your reading it will help with your understanding of form and structure your stick heights for the accents is a very practical benefit um but again you need to be careful because if you if you go too far down that route to the exclusion of all others you risk becoming a rudimental drummer and that's okay but you might not have intended that and you might have yeah. actually wanted to play along to queens of the stone age which is yeah. fine so don't necessarily go and spend all of your time working yeah. on Will Coxon, but I, I certainly think from a it, it's kind of like maybe not quite equivalent but it's like learning scales on a guitar it can only be beneficial but how far you choose to take it is dependent on what you want to get out of it ultimately yeah because it and, and it sort of falls back into that idea where you've emphasized having a, a an actual goal or a use for the thing yes. so when you're learning five stroke six stroke rolls or whatever then learn some mitch mitchell stuff that's it um, yeah, yeah. at the same time and yeah i mean it, it can be tricky because i'm i'm in favor of um people learning that stuff i think it's fun but sometimes when you know, again with, especially with the younger students they want to learn taylor hawkins uh yeah. type of things which is you know, it's a sort of single stroke. I mean, a lot of rock playing is 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 not going to encourage people to want to do uh, rudimental drumming necessarily. But yeah, so there, there, yeah, there seems to be 
yeah, you don't have to do the rudiments. I think singles, doubles, and paradiddles is enough if that's what you're happy with. But it, it is very enriching to to get into that from the historical point mm. of view, from yeah, making that connection uh, between the origins of the snare drumming sort of tradition, how that evolved into the drum set is kind mm. of cool as well. Um, so have, with your like the, the the drum solo composition stuff, I'm guessing that's kind of quite hard I haven't I, I've had I had a look at one of your books and we'll talk about that you've, you've had some yeah it, uh, it, it is hard it is hard it wasn't intentionally so like I didn't just sit down and think right what's the hardest thing I can write mm -hmm. but because of there's a lot of snare drum material out there yeah. so I, I didn't just want to do my own version of something that already existed if I was writing if I went into this to write rudimental solos with my background and with the things I've studied and familiar with, I would basically be doing my impression of John Pratt or Will Coxon. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, like, that's not the point. The point is to explore what what we can do on this instrument, to explore different compositional concepts. So I kind of, by necessity, had to allow it to develop as far as it needed to develop. So yes, the, the pieces are hard. And actually, even though you know reviews and things have been really favorable and I've received some wonderful feedback, I think Bear in mind, it was my first attempt at a serious release, and I've sort of refined it since. The main criticism of any, if any, was that they probably are too hard for most people. Right. And, and that's, that's not necessarily a source of pride, but nor is it a source of shame. It's just that's the way it transpired, because the concepts I was exploring resulted in some, not necessarily difficult, I suppose, but unfamiliar unfamiliar applications, unfamiliar voicings, unfamiliar vocabulary, unfamiliar time signatures or things like this. So yeah, they are difficult, but that was just kind of a byproduct of exploring some different compositional concepts. Yeah, but you're not recommending I should buy one of them then and try and learn it before I do some other... <laughs> <laughs> no, I get this a lot. I, I get this a lot from <laughs> students, when, especially new students new to me who know yeah. that I've got these books and they straight away they say, oh, should I buy your collection of composition? Should I buy Snare Drum Virtuoso? And I was like, well, the clue's in the title. Yeah. You know, this, is, <laughs> this is difficult material, so maybe we can we can build up Work to that. Up to it, yeah. But just, so, to, just to go back to something you were saying um, on the rudimental stuff, just interestingly, a lot of drum kit students I have where they, you know, maybe they've come to me after being after playing for a long time and they want to just improve a few areas. I invariably find that spending some time on the rudimental repertoire actually helps to fix a lot of their issues in other areas as well, even if they don't want to go and play all the Wilcox and stuff yep. by spending a bit of time focusing on rudimental work and getting them to think about the execution of strokes and the clarity of the rhythm. And even some, in, even in some cases, just the reading the notation seems to unlock a lot of doors in their minds and their own understanding. Even if they have no real interest in it, they go, well, yeah. I never knew this. I never thought about that. I never understood that before. And having that approach can actually just help bridge other areas of, uh, as well. So in that sense, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say all drummers need to go out and buy my book, even my students. But I know from experience, having very difficult material that you don't understand, I've got plenty on my shelves that I bought not really understanding it, was still enough for me to go, well, I don't understand this, but I'm going to go and explore it. I'm going to go and try and understand it. And that in itself was very, very helpful. Yeah, I think that that's quite an interesting point because uh, something in my, uh, I think my, my mindset is very often uh, quite sort of to deconstruct and break things down. And I think yeah. I, I have a certain uh, ability to explain things very clearly in these little uh, building blocks of stuff. Yeah. And I'm also discovering that actually just throwing people in the deep end and going, oh, just play that. Or, you know, this uh, you, you look at the um, notation or something and write the count above a couple of bars mm. and say, oh, kind mm. of get on with it. There's a, there's an element of learning there that's slightly, you know, there's this kind of deconstructed, sensible, yeah. scientific learning. And there's this slightly mysterious thing of like, oh, just have a crack at this. Mm. And oh, sort of, um, oh, just play it. Go on, just play it. It's, it's yeah. this one, yeah. Yana, blah blah blah. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, I find with the, like, especially I've, I've got quite a lot of long term students. I'm lucky enough to say, and I try to trace back where where exactly did all this skill come from. And yeah. if I analyse, you know, in terms of the sort of more regular stuff that I do, it's not always that clear to me how that uh, added up to the end result. And so mm. I look at, uh, especially like with young students, but even with my adult students who've come to me with a pair of sticks in their hand, never played the drum before, and now they're out playing a gig or something like that. 
and they're doing all this stuff that doesn't relate directly to things that we've learned. And yeah. there is definitely an element in the educational process of, oh, somehow the things that we did and maybe other things that they did and thought about and so on and so forth, sort of resulted in this other thing and i think that actually addressing or approaching stuff that's beyond your ability level can yeah, yeah. unlock that i think that that's exposure right. to it is really important isn't it yeah i think it, it, and, and times that i've tried to play stuff that i just can't do and I, i've tried to uh, develop like a self um awareness about the process of trying to i was going to say avoid but just not opening myself up to like get frustrated so sometimes i'll sit and play something that's really tricky and i just think ah oh, well if it comes out or doesn't come out that's fine as long as i'm aware and i try to put this across you know this this idea of like if you're aware of what you're trying to do and maybe this comes back a little bit to some of those neurological studies if you have the map of where you're trying to go it doesn't matter if you're just sort of stumbling around a little bit some of the time uh, because right. if your brain recognizes this is the thing i wanted or this is the thing i didn't right. want either one of those starts creating those little programs in the head i think that that's move you to where you well, want to go. well andrew huberman from stanford university he's, he's in the neuroscience department well published author and researcher on neuroscience and, and yeah. theories of learning and he he talks about this exactly new findings are showing actually more and more the importance of mistakes the importance yeah. of getting it wrong and apparently even in something like cases of a thousand repetitions if you only get three or four of them correct he was using the example of um serving in tennis if you if you serve a thousand times and 997 of them are bad but yeah. three of them are good or two or three of them are good your brain will focus on the good ones and learn from the good ones and essentially when it reruns through all of those processes at, when you're asleep it will essentially disregard all of the bad yeah. ones or, yeah. or analyze them and then disregard them and focus on the three good ones so yeah the the importance of trying it and getting it wrong and trying it and getting it wrong and exploring it and that exposure to it is being shown through the research and the science to be more and more important as well. Yeah, and I, I think the experience bears that out. I've seen him talking about that as well, even though I've, sometimes I find he's a little bit confident about these things. But so it's very uh, new, as yeah, it's very yeah, recent, has, so yeah, still to come. But it sounds right and it does definitely mesh with, with my experience of learning stuff, which is, again, having a, um, a sort of relaxed attitude uh, I guess I, I try and put it to people having a relaxed attitude about things being right or wrong if you're doing it right all the time again you, you know that that's not going to be learning because mm. that's just playing the same thing so it's yeah. it's kind yeah. of obvious in a way that it's like forcing yourself into a place of some sort of stress if you like or you know yeah. getting into making mistakes is fine and, and I do actually I, I think that sounds right even if you're making mistakes all the time but mm. you it's the, it's it's if you're doing it without consciousness then um uh, i that's not going to get you anywhere but if you know right i'm trying to achieve this and that's not happening i think somehow the brain is working that that does sound right yeah i think so um and yeah that's kind of interesting um so as I, yeah, I was just thinking when, when you are teaching people this rudimental stuff do you make a point of then bringing that to the drum set as you're doing it or do, do you say okay we're going to look at the i guess it's different every student's different than what they mm -hmm. want but okay we're going to learn how to play some uh, snare drum solos that develop this that and the other are you going to deliberately uh, say and now you're going to play all these different paradiddle permutations on the kit or do mm -hmm. you let again I, I know it's individual but just just for um the thought process a little bit do you do you feel like you're actively going to uh present the drum kit options or do you just leave it as as a thing in itself and see what the student does with it generally generally yes in certain cases so we we all any any student that i've got that's working on rudimental stuff we, we're working on a piece always you you're not just here's a five stroke roll let's practice a five stroke roll for six weeks it's here's a piece mm -hmm. So let's focus on the piece. And as they're learning this, they're getting stronger at the technique, stronger at the reading, stronger at the vocabulary. So then if they are kit players as well, I, I do have some dedicated snare drum players, students, but if they are drum kit players as well, I understand, you know, this is ultimately a, a means to an end. Rather than saying like, well, let's, let's take bar number four and apply that to the drum kit. What we might say is, well, let's look at the concept of what's going on in bar number four. So maybe bar number four has got a flammer cue and they've never encountered a flammer cue before. So in the course of learning the piece, they're encountering this particular sticking pattern with the accents and the flams. So then we might say, well, okay, well, let's explore a flammer cue a bit further and see what we can do with a flammer cue on the drum kit. 
maybe we can split that flammicule around, use it as a fill, what happens if we do it like this or like this? And we do, I do this a lot with the measured rolls, five stroke rolls and seven stroke rolls, but it becomes more of a concept. So what can, actually, what can we do with rolls generally on a drum kit? You know, the, um, the different interpretations to syncopation where you're, you're playing yeah. roles within the accent pattern. That's just an extension of that same concept. Yeah. So I, I, I would certainly say yes, for drum kit players, there is a conscious element of extracting the material and applying it to the drum kit, but it's certainly on a, on a broader conceptual level rather than let's just play, let's just play this piece on the kit now. Yeah, so cause I think that can really help the, the motivation of just uh, guiding people into that space, but also, you know, trying to suggest it's an experimental, process yeah. is kind of fun and i'm still trying to work out i mean yeah i don't know if i've worked out a flamacue what to do on the drum kit but <laughs> I, I still try and work, work that out and yeah whenever i work on rudimental stuff with students I'm, I'm trying to bring them into uh how you apply that to the drum kit but not to over over sort of state what, what they should mm. do with it it's um, interesting we're talking about the flamacue actually because i think off the top of my head it occurs in grade four of the trinity syllabus which is right. roughly r roughly halfway up the graded syllabus. And I've got a student, I think he's coming tonight actually, who's working on his grade four. And in the technical, in the technical section of the grade, there is a flamacue in one of the technical studies that involves taking it around the kit. And he will go, he, if, if, assuming he sticks with it and carries on and does well like he is doing, he will go on to be one of these drummers that will have a working understanding of flamacues because he's encountered it early on as part of yeah. this kind of structured edu educational approach. The vast majority of people I encounter who haven't heard of a flamacue, just for example, you know, are people that never did that and have never encountered it in the rudimental repertoire. And it's, a, as you're suggesting, it's not something that's difficult to play necessarily. It's just, well, what do I do with this? Yeah. What's it supposed to be? What's it for? So there is it, it does occur in sort of two main places it, it occurs in the main um curriculum of the various syllabi and it occurs in the rudimental repertoire and if mm -hmm. you're not experienced with either of those it's very very likely you've not encountered a, a flat flamacue at all yeah so um just to touch on your other books like the drum set books um, yeah i got a copy well there's actually i've ended up with two books because of you because you also mentioned a, a book i can't remember the name but a book that a guy wrote where he describes the practice process in a lot of detail which is one of the only drum books i've ever seen and that was oh, the right. thing. i think it was a comment you made on one of your videos i thought oh i need to check that out and now right. i can't remember the name of the, the damn thing but uh it's very good it's sort of quite a difficult book he deals with lots of styles there's a bunch of latin stuff in there but he explains in in a lot of detail um Oh, I can't remember the name now because I just got it. I've been reading it. I haven't done mm. any of it. But yeah, it's because uh, a lot of books don't explain how to practice. Mm. Maybe um, Garibaldi does in uh, mm. Future Sounds. He gives a lot of insight. But um, oh, now, now I've lost my, my train. So yeah, I was thinking you've written, uh, I think, three drum set books. And I bought your sort of funk coordination one. Yeah. Uh, and there's a jazz coordination one. And then there's the one with the um, broken patterns. Broken time, right? yeah. Broken time drumming, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the um, the jazz and the funk ones are really, I mean, I got the funk and rock one, and it's kind of like you've written out the chafey fat back exercises in a way. Yeah. Uh, it's a slight, slight simplification, but actually I think that's really a helpful thing, and I think a lot of people would, would benefit from getting that. So maybe just to sort of finish off, what was the motivation from that? Did you do that before you got into the snare drumming thing? And uh, how, how are those books doing like that? They they came about, uh, they, they are, despite the write-up at the beginning, they are the least conceptual of, of any of the work I've produced. They are the most practical because I'd done a lot of work. I, I did one on linear drumming in 2017, oh, I think, yeah, I and, and, and then broken time drumming. And they were both really big, like conceptual explorations of the concept. And that's great. Um, I, I'm you know pleased with them and they, they do well. Um, but I found in my own private students, I was forever giving them the same sheets, the same exercises. You know, when you've got a brand new student and you're trying to cover a basic funk rock style or something like that to get to the point where they can play. I found I was forever giving out the same solos and then writing out the same pieces, writing out the same coordination patterns just to get them exposed to what was possible. So I just thought, well, I've got half of this stuff already lying around on my computer. Why don't I just start to combine it into a codified system? And you mentioned the Chafee stuff, I think, that he was a 
Was it the Chafee you mentioned, or was it Garibaldi? Anyway, yes, I... yes Chafee, because uh, he has the thing where you've got those fat back exercises. That's but it. It, it, it. You have I mean, to conceptualize all, of... all that's the, it. the hand well, that, that was I had students where I'd recommended the Chafee material to, and for each one of them, I'd have to write it out for them anyway, or they'd have to yeah. have to go home and write it out because with it, without experience it's very difficult to imagine or visualize where the symbol pattern needs to be mm. so these were kind of in response to that it is so much easier when the student can just see it here's the yeah. right symbol, here's the hi-hat here's the bass drum here's the snare drum and suddenly obviously not not it's not magic but mm. when they can see it suddenly they can yeah suddenly they can play that pattern that fat back pattern that coordination that previously might have been a few weeks of head scratching going right where's the right symbol supposed to be and it was it was just as a as a response to something i was encountering in my teaching but ironically actually they they probably from a from a business commercial perspective those two books are probably my worst performers because okay. i think the people such that they are who would come to me and buy my books or have lessons with me i think they are interested in my conceptual approach more yeah, than that makes you know, sense. just uh, just a, a, yeah, they're, they're probably the most typical drum book uh, whatever whatever yeah, that it's, means. i mean it's 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 a kind of saturated marketplace but i think it, it i think the the book is yeah. is a nice uh because there's not enough uh, emphasis again with it, just um reflecting on the this idea of like there's certain very important bits of information that don't get mentioned mm. one of them is vocabulary acquisition yes doesn't uh, isn't sort of really advertised enough, I don't think. And uh, yeah. th those books are really, really great. So um, I think the people, and there's a lot of people teaching themselves how to play and just trying to develop their skills. And those books would be fantastic for, for people who just want to try and improve yeah, I, their vocabularies. I think they're a, uh, a practical uh, tool. Yeah. yeah, they're a great tool for that. So, but I, I, I didn't, I don't devote enough time to them from a promotional aspect, because honestly, I'm personally more interested in various conceptual work but probably to my detriment because I, I probably should promote them more but but yeah, yeah they are they are probably the most practical and the most accessible of everything i've done yeah i think i think potentially i'm, I'm sort of uh, just highlighting those at the end because uh my well i don't know if anyone's going to be watching this at the end i suppose but um yeah and i'll put links and all to all of your sure. stuff so in the description below this video there will be links to all of jonathan's various bits and bobs but um uh, yeah, I think that those books are, are books that would be really useful to anybody uh, who's the, the kind of people following my channel, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd mention those as well. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks but, for the um, yeah, cool. Anyway, you, you, I know you've got a busy day of teaching ahead of you, and I think this might be a good lull to sort of uh, wind things up. So uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for sort of uh, having a punt at uh, being interviewed by a novice interviewer. Or, thank is you very interviewer much for having me. A person. Uh, yeah, yeah, and um, I don't know, is there anything you'd like to sort of throw in at the end? Um... I think I think anybody any anybody learning an instrument needs to just stay grounded with it. It's very easy to get carried away with all of the information out there and all of the amazing players out there. And I remember having a conversation with an old friend a few years ago. He was a guitarist and he was listening to to Guthrie Govan, and it, he said, "Oh, I just feel depressed now. It just makes me want to quit." And I just remember saying, "Well, why? You know, we know there are people out there who are phenomenally good." we know enjoy it learn from it you know it doesn't detract from what you have to offer it doesn't detract from your own work he was an amazing player and yet he couldn't see that because he was listening to Guthrie Govan at the time you know it's easy to watch a video of Virgil Donati and think well it's either that or nothing and I can't do that so I'm nothing you know there's there's a whole artistic spectrum to explore and I think that's probably been the most benefit to me I have no guarantee when I write a book or compose something, I have no guarantee that it's good. I have no guarantee that anybody's going to look at it or like it or buy it or play it or anything like that. But for me, it's an honest contribution to the art form. It's something that I wanted to say and I've tried my best to say it and that's enough for me. Um, if people like it, that's great. If people don't like it, that's okay too. But that shouldn't ever stop you from, you know, trying. You, you should try, try to do what's right for you, find your own voice and, and speak with that. Yeah, that absolutely. Nobody would dis well. I definitely wouldn't disagree. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. It's 
cool. OK, thank you very much, Jonathan. I've enjoyed that a lot. And uh, yeah, maybe we can talk again sometime. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers.